Hi, Why Religion friends. Welcome to another great episode of the Why Religion podcast. Professor Anthony Sweat here. Joseph Smith famously said that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth. Because Latter-day Saints believe the Book of Mormon translation was a divine miracle, we can sometimes make the assumption that what Joseph Smith meant by that was that the Book of Mormon text was in a perfected state, without any grammatical or English errors in it. But that isn't what Joseph seemed to mean by that statement. His very next line, after discussing how the Book of Mormon was the most correct, had to do with readers abiding by the precepts taught in the book. He didn't seem to be saying the grammatical or English expressions were perfect. Indeed, even Mormon seemed to warn us against such a position, telling us, quote, Now if there are faults, they are the mistakes of men. Wherefore, condemn not the things of God, end of quote. Some may not know that there have been thousands of textual variants to the English text of the Book of Mormon. Most of them are very minor and grammatical, but some are expressions and words that significantly impact the reading and understanding of the text. When comparing the existing original manuscript with the printer's manuscript, with the first published 1830 text, and then the 1837 and 1840 editions of the Book of Mormon, overseen by Joseph Smith, these changes become more evident. One person, perhaps more than any other, who has dedicated his scholarly life to finding, comparing, and understanding these changes to the Book of Mormon text is Royal Skousen who has spent more than 25 years meticulously researching and publishing on these changes. His multi-volume and ongoing critical text project is some of the most important scholarly work being done on the Book of Mormon today. Professor Nick Frederick, a Book of Mormon textual scholar himself in the Department of Ancient Scripture, has recently published an article on the contributions of Royal Skousen to Book of Mormon research. Between the first published version in 1830, and today you have about 20 different editions of the Book of Mormon. And in some cases, the verses read differently. And so it's not that this doesn't go to challenging in any way, shape, or form the divine origins of the Book of Mormon. This is more about interpretation, right? If you're going to sit down with a verse and say, okay, here's what this verse means, it's helpful to recognize this verse may have changed. If we're going to make commentary on, if we're going to understand what this text is, Someone's got to do the work. And so Royal said, I'll be the one to do it. Today's episode takes us into Royal Skousen's textual analysis research and some of the fascinating insights about the divine Book of Mormon text and translation process that his work has uncovered. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Ryan Sharp sat down with his BYU Ancient Scripture colleague, Professor Nick Frederick, to interview him and discuss with him his recent publication on Royal Skousen and the Book of Mormon Critical Text Project. In this first part, Dr. Frederick introduces us to the idea of textual variants in the Book of Mormon and where they come from. He will also discuss Royal Skousen and his ongoing multi-volume Book of Mormon critical text project and reasons why Royal Skousen's work is impactful to the study of the Book of Mormon. So here is Dr. Nick Frederick. We're here to talk about a recent publication you had in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies entitled, It is not an easy task, but it cannot be avoided, on the contributions of Royal Skousen. It's a long title, isn't it? (laughs) I I love it. It's a mouthful. Yeah. Uh, In this article, you tell a fascinating story about how you became interested in the work of Royal Skousen, and I'd love to start with that. Uh, Maybe walk our listeners through your experience discovering uh, Royal Skousen and the work, the important work that he's done. 
Yes, when I came to BYU as an undergrad back in around 2000 or so, I was a classics major. Uh, I was really interested in New Testament studies, taking a fair amount of courses on New Testament and uh, you know, reading the Greek text. And when you spend time with the Greek text of the New Testament, you quickly learn that of you know, the field of textual criticism, that there's a lot of different you know, textual variants. There's a lot of different uh, ways of reading the, uh, the text of the New Testament. And so there's kind of a, there's a general instability that comes with the text. And as I took my Greek and Hebrew classes, I just became comfortable with the idea that the Bible was a little bit of an unstable text. Uh, there were just some places where we, you know, the verses, the text, we kind of was the, the best guess of the scholars, but there were just some places where we didn't necessarily know, for example, the long ending of Mark or something like that. And uh, but I just never assumed when it came to the Book of Mormon, I just figured that you know that I taught it on my mission, I'd read it in the seminary, I'd spent time with it my whole life. Never really thought that the Book of Mormon was any different in its origins than that the words that were on the page, you know, the scriptures that I memorized, the passages that I taught. Just figured it was kind of the book that I had was as it came out of the, you know, the the 1830 printing of the Book of Mormon. Let me, can I pause you right yeah, there? Yeah, please. So go back with me. Let's define a couple of terms here. So you used the phrase textual variance and textual criticism. Maybe help uh, help us understand what you mean by that and maybe provide an example. Sure. Uh, so textual criticism is essentially, it's a field of biblical studies. Uh, it's the science or the art uh, that seeks to determine the most reliable reading of a text. For example, the New Testament, there's about 6,000 different manuscript copies of the New Testament that are all a little bit different, right? That all have um, maybe certain words aren't the same. Uh, Maybe certain verses might be present in one copy but not another. Uh, You know, the most famous example, perhaps, the long ending of the Gospel of Mark, where the first eight verses are considered to be authentic to Mark, but verses 9 through 20 in Mark 16, they're not present in a lot of the early manuscripts. And so the thought is that, well, you know, and for other various reasons, the language is a little bit different. Um, it doesn't really jive with the rest of the Gospel of Mark that someone came along and added that in later. But maybe Mark ends with verse 8. And so this is one of the topics of discussion for biblical scholars, is to kind of figure out what is that original reading. If, if we were to travel back in time to when Mark is writing his closing you know, chapter, what does that look like when he's done? And so that's kind of the question that kind of faces a, a textual scholar is getting back to the original text. So for Book of Mormon Studies, this essentially, you know, what does this look like? Um, again, just, we'll get into this later, but just based upon your idea of translation, what that looks like, what does this, what does the Book of Mormon look like when we consider its earliest English version. Um, a couple of examples, First Nephi 12.18 has a couple of really interesting ones. Um, we have reference to the sword of justice, but it could also be construed based upon evidence, the, the word of justice, right? And those, those are two very different things, I think. Um, more importantly, First Nephi 12.18 uh, in the original 1830 publication, mentioned Jesus Christ by name. And then in 1837, Joseph Smith is going back and doing a revision of that, and he takes out the name of Jesus Christ and replaces it with Messiah. And so today, sometimes we talk about how, well, the earliest mention of Jesus in our Book of Mormon isn't until 2 Nephi 25. That's true in its our current Book of Mormon. In the 2013 edition. The 2013 edition, but that's not the case if we consider the earliest versions of the Book of Mormon, including the 1830 first published version. And let me me jump in with a a quick follow-up, if that's okay. So you used the phrase unstable earlier, talking about uh, the the New Testament. Maybe help our listeners understand why that shouldn't be alarming or jarring or or, uh, something that, that shakes faith. Um, yeah, it definitely, definitely shouldn't be. I mean, we're not talking about that uh, the Bible that there's you know massive places where it could be you know entire swaths of the Gospel of John or letters of Paul or something like that. What we're just talking about is when you consider the serious study of the New Testament or the Old Testament, 
or the Book of Mormon, you just have to be aware that when you open up the pages of a standard version, you need to be aware that there's different ways these texts have been presented over time. Uh, In the case of the Book of Mormon, for example, you have the original manuscript, which Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery write in 1829. Uh, Then um, Oliver Cowdery makes a second copy called the Printer's Manuscript. And then you have between... The first published version in 1830, and today you have about 20 different editions of the Book of Mormon. And in some cases, the verses read differently. And so it's not that this doesn't go to challenging in any way, shape, or form the divine origins of the Book of Mormon. This is more about interpretation. Yeah. Right? If you're going to sit down with a verse and say, okay, here's what this verse means— it's helpful to recognize this verse may have changed. Here's, here's an alternate yeah. consideration. There might be there might be a difference in punctuation. There might be a comma in your version that wasn't there when Joseph Smith put it in. There might be, again, a, a, the addition of something singular might have been changed to plural. The verb tense may have changed. You know, and so as we consider, uh, again, sword versus word, you know, when you consider just uh, where we emphasize in the church sitting down and really engaging in a deep study of the Book of Mormon, ponder these words, right? Ponder these verses, just recognizing that what I have in front of me with my 2013 may may have, there might be different, there might be alternate readings that exist that I'd want to spend some time with. And and that potentially could enhance your study Absolutely. of the Book of Mormon. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, which it has for me, for yeah. sure. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, in the article, you mentioned the initial call for a, a critical text of the Book of Mormon from uh, Douglas Wilson. This is what you you wrote. Wilson's charge for a critical text of the Book of Mormon would be answered for the first time in 1984 with the second edition in 1987 with the publication of the Farms Book of Mormon critical text. Thanks in large part to the work of editor Robert F. Smith, the Farms Book of Mormon critical text was a step forward. Help us understand what that project entailed. What did it look like? Yeah, so Douglas Wilson is a non Latter Day Saint who was considering what's you know how can we make the the Book of Mormon uh, you know uh, uh, something that appeals to literary scholars, right? And he was like, you know, there's this is a romance. There's there's something here that would appeal to scholars outside the church, but just like with the Bible, you need to have a text that scholars can consult that has the original reading, right? You you want to go back as far as you can. The 1981 or the 2013 or whatever version you know, you're kind of looking over time, has been changed uh, in some respects. And so you want to make sure you have the earliest one there. Just anybody who deals with texts, you want to have the earliest version in front of you. In 1984, with the second edition 1987, there was an attempt made to look at uh, going back to the printer's manuscript and considering all the subsequent editions, both Latter-day Saint and Community of Christ editions, uh, that have been published since 1830 and kind of collate them all and look for places where there were differences, look for places where the text may have been altered. Um, they, they included footnotes to things like Josephus, texts like you know Herodotus, they put in dates. They tried to make it so that it kind of fit the, the scholarly version of the New Testament and Old Testament that existed for biblical scholars, and there would be something comparable there for Book of Mormon scholars. Yeah, very good. And so you mentioned that this is kind of where Royal Skousen enters the scene where he provides a review of this work. Uh, maybe walk through with us what what were some of his observations, and how did that then segue into him becoming uh, kind of the, the the leading scholar in this effort? Yeah. So Royal Skousen uh, was is a linguist was a linguistics professor at Brigham Young University. Uh, he was part of this project, at least a reviewer for it. He had input in it, as was Grant Hardy. If you've read Grant Hardy's Understand the Book of Mormon. Uh, was had a role in this earlier uh, critical tech project. Um, Royal is ha- has an incredible mind. He's an incredible thinker, and he was looking at this project, and he was he just noted that there were there were certain things about the methodology of this initial critical text project that weren't thorough enough. Uh, the biggest one was that the cri- that the first attempt at a critical pro- text project didn't use the original manuscript. Uh, by and large, because it wasn't really available in any form other than microfilm. It was using the printer. It was using the printer's manuscript as kind of the earliest version, and so and we we only have about twenty eight percent of the original manuscript, but there are some places where it's key, and just some some of the uh, the slight differences between 
what we have today. And, you know, uh, the original manuscript is our earliest version of the Book of Mormon. So Royal said, hey, you, you, we got to have, oh, we got to have the original manuscript as part of this. Um, they didn't really use computers for this first project. And Royal said we'd be able to do a lot better and identifying some of the differences between editions if we if we were able to have access to computers. And so he 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 types in both the original manuscript and the printer's manuscript, and then runs a, a comparison program to find where the differences are. Um, he also recognizes that, you know, where the critical text project was looking for kind of the textual variants, uh, they also looked for quotations from the Bible, quotations from the New Testament. Um, Royal also recognized that their methodology wasn't quite as firm as it could be in identifying what's a biblical quotation and what might just be general language and things like that. And so while it was a good first effort, it it didn't really clear the bar as far as needing to be uh, what scholars could use, especially when you consider what the old, what the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament have. And so this is you know this is 1988. So this is about you know three or four years after this first attempt is published. Royal decides to take on this project himself, and just to give you you know the scope of this, this 1988. That's 34 years. He's still working on this. He's still not done, and it's been almost you know four decades of work. This was a massive, massive undertaking. Uh, we're, we're, he's pretty close to the end. There's probably one more volume that's going to come out early next year. And to give us an idea, how many volumes are there right now? And in- uh, there's about 15. There's about 15 volumes in this. He's what Royal has done is is you can find uh, the he's typed up the original manuscript and the printer's manuscript. Uh, subsequently, the Joseph Smith Papers versions have kind of replaced those. But back in back in the 90s, that's what we used was was Royal Skousen's version. He's got six volumes of commentary just on the different textual variants, just the places where the where the text of the Book of Mormon reads differently now than it has in you know, a previous point in time. We can talk about some of those later. Uh, then he's got uh, six volumes where he looks at the um, the vocabulary, just kind of the the nature of the language that Joseph Smith is using, as well as some of the spelling and punctuation that's been done. I mean, this this is it's absolutely thorough. And he has left no stone unturned in this project. So to, to help our listeners kind of visualize this, so I open up the book, uh, what one of these volumes, and it has a passage of passage of scripture, and then it shows me both kind of both variants and then describes which one he thinks should be considered, or maybe visualize it, help us visualize yeah. it. So just going back to this uh, example of Jesus Christ being present in First Nephi 12, 18, you'd open up in volume one of the textual variants, one of the, the volume one of the first you know, of these six volumes, the first one, you'd open up First Nephi 12, 18, and you, you would see you know what it said originally, and then it would show you what Joseph changed it to in 1837, and then you would have a list of those 20 different editions and what editions said what. And then you would have about a page to two pages of commentary on Royal giving you his thoughts on why Joseph in 1837 uh, replaced Jesus Christ with Messiah. He includes primary sources of people who were there, uh, if, if that's helpful. But in, by and large part, it's just some well thought out, well reasoned conclusions on um, why these different changes were made. Yeah. And we're talking thousands and thousands of pages here. Yeah, really helpful. Let's dive into an example. Uh, you write, one way to illustrate the pivotal role that Skousen's work continues to play in the present world of Book of Mormon studies comes through following an ongoing debate as to the origin and nature of the Words of Mormon. Un- unpack that for us. So the Words of Mormon is a, is a funny text. Um, in the, if you look at the the different early versions of this again, we're spending most of our time the three key versions here: the original manuscript, the printer's manuscript, the 1830 publication, and then really close to those you have eight, the 1837 revision Joseph does, and then a second revision Joseph does in 1840. And so those are kind of the five key texts that people look at when they consider. Uh, the nature of some of these changes, right? And is that because Joseph's alive in those? Because Joseph is the one doing it. Yeah. Um, a- after you know, a- after the 1840 edition, you've got Orson Pratt 
you know, doing a lot of things. Orson Pratt, of course, gives us our modern chapters and verses in the 1879 Book of Mormon, the 1920 Book of Mormon that the Scripture Committee makes that kind of arranges things in parallel columns and aligns it more with the Bible, things like that. But the, the ones that Joseph's directly involved in, the original, the printers, the 1830, the 1837, and the 1840. Okay, And so when you consider the words of Mormon, um, there is over the, the text of Mosiah chapter 1, which, so you have got the words of Mormon, you go to Mosiah chapter 1 in the printer's manuscript, and it originally says Mosiah 3. But then two of those, it's in three kind of three lines, two of those have been crossed out, so now it just looks like it, Mosiah 1. And so scholars have said, well, what does that mean, right? Mosiah starts differently. There's no kind of italicized paragraph. The other books in the Book of Mormon, they begin with these italicized paragraphs. Mosiah doesn't have one. And Mosiah, the books in the Book of Mormon tend to begin with the people after whom they're named, right? Mosiah begins with Benjamin. And so it seems like there's something missing at the front of the Book of Mosiah. And so people of, you know, royals dug into this. He spent a lot of time looking and examining what might that three mean. Uh, why does the words of Mormon have a two written over it in, um, in the printer's manuscript? And so there's been a, a fair amount of scholarly kind of conversation about what does this say about the nature of the words of Mormon? And so, for example, and again, this is all using Royal's work. And the first time that I kind of was introduced to Royal's work was an article that came out right around 2003 by a fellow named Christopher Conkling, who's looking at the Amlicites and the Amalekites in the Book of Mormon. And when you get to the Book of Alma, you realize there's these people called the Amlicites, right, that appear right around, you know, Alma chapter 2, Alma chapter 3. But then they disappear and you get this group called the Amalekites. Just kind of randomly of thrown in, yeah. And then they, you know, when we're talking about the missionary efforts of, of Ammon and Aaron and into the war chapters, and you're just like, well, who are these Amalekites? And Royal, as he had gone through and kind of noted this, suggested that, you know, kind of what had happened was Amalekites had become Amalekites. You just, you add an A, after that first, you know, A-M-L, so you add a second A there, it becomes Amalekites, right, versus Amlicites, and it's actually the same people, hmm. okay? And so scholars had kind of been building upon Royal's work for a while. Conkling based his scholarship on, on discoveries that Royal had made and theories that Royal had made about the Amalekites and the Amlicites. And so the same thing kind of happens with the words of Mormon. And so you look at these 18 verses, you've got, you know, a couple of scholars who said... Uh, published a BYU studies article, um, Jack Line and Kent Minson, back in around 2013 or so, um, who say that uh, their argument is that verses 1 through 11 of the Words of Mormon are essentially the, the, the end of the 116 pages, right? That's where Joseph led up to. And then 12 through 18 are actually the last seven verses of Mosiah chapter 2 which is why then there was a 3 written over Mosiah 1. That was originally Mosiah 3, but then because we don't have 116 pages, Oliver or someone crosses out the 3 and makes it 1, which is why it's our Mosiah chapter 1 today. So suggesting that these other two chapters were likely on the last 116 yeah, pages. Yeah, that's kind of the idea is that the 116 pages extended into Mosiah, right? And so is the Words of Mormon somehow, um, is somehow part of that process? Um, Brant Gardner published an article uh, a little while, a bit after that, kind of taking on this question, and he suggested that uh, the two above the text of the Words of Mormon suggested that they originally thought that Omni had a second chapter, right? And that uh, verses 12 through 18 of the Words of Mormon was essentially a revelation from God, kind of filling in the gaps of what was lost by the hundred. 16 pages. And so that's not stuff that was actually on the plates, those seven verses there, let's catch readers up on what they're missing. That's why the end of the Words of Mormon reads very different than the first 11 verses, right? All of a sudden now it's it's a kind of a really, really quick summary of what, who Benjamin is and what Benjamin has done and things like that. So when you get to our Mosiah chapter 1, it makes sense. Um, you've got a, a, a another fellow who wrote an article just a couple years ago, uh, Clifford Jones, who argued that the words of Mormon, the entirety of the words of Mormon, is Mosiah chapter 2. And so that, again, 
you can see all of this is based upon royal kind of looking at what does this three mean above Mosiah chapter one and noting it and saying, highlighting it and saying, hey, this is important. And now all these publications are being done trying to building off of Royal's work, just like we, with Amlicites and Amalekites. Royal says, hey, there's something going on here in the text. And so people come in and say, well, let's try to figure that out. But if Royal's not in there digging into the text, uncovering these things, um, who knows if anybody sees them. And, and you mentioned names like, and you said uh, Grant Hardy, Brant Gardner, Terrell Givens, uh, also is built upon this, and and I love this uh, statement in your article, and and I'm going to read it, and then give you a chance if you want to add anything to it. You you mentioned what I'm trying to illustrate here is the game changing nature of the critical text project. Often an author's work is uh, is used to substantiate an argument made by another author. Author, but in the case of this ongoing dialogue about the words of Mormon, Skousen's work isn't simply part of the argument; rather, it serves as both the catalyst and the foundation. The various modes of argumentation come down, quite simply, to interpretation of Skousen's evidence. Rather than providing a piece to the puzzle, the critical text project, at least in this case, has provided all the pieces, leaving it up to those who would assemble it to decide the end result. Uh, so beautifully summarized. Any, oh, anything you. you want to add to that? Um, one must know what a text says before she or he can tell you how and why it says it. Right, and that's really what Royal does. Is he's sitting there saying, "Look, I'm I'm going to do the work, and it's tedious, and no one else wants to do it because it's going to take 40 years to do it. But someone has to do it. If we're going to make commentary on, if we're going to understand what this text is, someone's got to do the work. And so Royal said, "I'll be the one to do it." And now you've got scholars like Brant Gardner and Grant Hardy and Tarot Givens and the one, you know, the ones we just talked about with Words of Mormon, who are looking at Royal's work and finding all this fertile ground to do scholarship and to raise some really important questions. But Royal's the one who, who's kind of laying out the, you know, bringing the text and saying, okay, here's what the text says. Now let's analyze, go to work. let's go to work on it. And that's, and that's what's happened. Yeah. At, toward the end of the article, and, and now we'll transition to the, the second section of our conversation where we, we really talk about the relevance. And, and obviously we've been alluding to this throughout the discussion um, in the article you write, now that we have a sense for the trajectory and impact of Skousen's work, at this point I want to turn attention to what I consider to be three uh, the three most significant contributions to Book of Mormon studies that have been generated through Skousen's efforts. So maybe just walk through these one at a time, and I'll just uh, give our listeners the, the heads up. So the first is the Book of Mormon, the earliest text. The second is what, uh, what you describe as the tight control theory of Book of Mormon translation, and then the third, the nature of the Book of Mormon's archaic language. So with that, uh, let's just kind of go through each of these one at a time, and, and maybe you can introduce our listeners to some of these important contributions. So uh, Royal published kind of his, probably his most important work, which was with Yale University Press, the Book of Mormon, the earliest text, which was his... Um, in, in his opinion, as when, when Joseph, and we'll talk about translation in a minute, but as Joseph is reading the words off the stone, off the seer stone, right, and Oliver Cowdery is writing these down, what does the language of the Book of Mormon look like at that point, right? Before kind of human error of copying comes in, you know, what does the earliest version of the English Book of Mormon look like? And when was this published? Uh, 2009. It came out in 2009. Um, and again, Royal just all the work he'd been doing, studying the variant texts, looking at different editions. If you're going to have one volume of Royal Scouse, and this is the one, this is the one to get. And so what he does is, is he's he's he kind of come up with. I think he says I think the number is 612. There are 612 new readings of the Book of Mormon um, that have never appeared in any version of the Book of Mormon. That that he has gone through and kind of um, uncovered, he would say. Uh, he goes through and he he restores what he considers to be the earliest version um, of the text. Uh, so some of the major kind of some of the major uh, the ones that get a lot of press, some of the textual changes that get a lot of press. For example, um, in First Nephi eleven where in the original edition of the Book of Mormon, it talks about um, Mary being the mother of God. In 1837, Joseph changes that to Mary being the mother of the Son of God, right? And that's our version of it today. 
or in 1 Nephi chapter 20, verse 1, where it talks, where Nephi is quoting Isaiah, and you, you get this um, waters of Judah passage with this kind of... Um, like a parenthetical. Or, or, yeah, statement. kind of this, then it's followed by, or out of the waters of baptism. And so I remember studying this in seminary. I remember using some mission with this idea that baptism existed in the Old Testament because Isaiah is talking about baptism, right? And you know what one of the things Royal does in this earliest text is he goes back and says, okay, that wasn't there. And when when in First Nephi chapter twenty verse one, there was no or out of the waters of baptism. What happens is in eighteen forty, Joseph Smith is making his second kind of revision of the Book of Mormon. And he inserts that as kind of a marginal comment. It's in parentheses. Almost like a Joseph Smith translation yeah, to the Book of Mormon. it really is. And so Joseph's kind of saying, well, the waters of Judah could be interpreted kind of as the waters of baptism. In 1920, the Scripture Committee puts Joseph's version into 1 Nephi chapter 20, verse 1, but they take away the parentheses. They offset it by commas, which is how it reads today. But uh, that's not, it's not part of the original text of the Book of Mormon. Uh, Mary being the mother of the Son of God isn't part of the original text. There's two places where, um, in our modern version of the Book of Mormon, it talks about Mosiah doing something. And in both in those two cases, uh, Mosiah 21 and Ether 4, the original text reads Benjamin, not Mosiah, which changes how you interpret the narrative. And so Royal's going back through and trying to say, okay, here's the earliest way. If you want to read the earliest version of the Book of Mormon before some of these other changes came in, before some of these, and as, as important as those changes are, right? Um, anytime Joseph provides commentary on the Book of Mormon, I'm listening. But if we want to look at what its earliest version looks like, that's what this Yale text is doing, is showing us what, um, I, I, like I said, as it appeared, as the words appeared to Joseph Smith on the seer stone or on the Nephite interpreters, that's what Royal uh, gives you in the uh, Book of Mormon, the earliest text. Wonderful. So then the second is the tight control theory for a Book of Mormon translation. The topic of translation is one that comes up a lot. You know, how does how do we get a text written in Egyptian and put it in English, right? As a lot of our artwork shows Joseph kind of running his fingers over the plates, kind of almost as if he's doing what we would consider translation to be, right? Taking it from one language and putting it into another. But what Royal um, did is he, he takes all the witness statements, the people who were there who witnessed Joseph Smith translating, all right? So Oliver Cowdery, uh, David Whitmer, Emma Smith, and he identifies four kind of uh, common threads. The first is that Joseph saw in some fashion the English text on the Book of Mormon, uh, the, the English text of the Book of Mormon. Joseph then read off that text, right, to a scribe. The scribe then hears the text, and then the scribe wrote down what they heard, right? That, se that seems to be the process by which translation worked. And so for Skousen, the question here is one of control, right? How much, how much uh, control does, does kind of the, the Lord maintain to make sure that at no point, Joseph reading, Joseph reciting, the scribes hearing, the scribes writing, Mistakes can be made at any point in that process. How much control was put into main, making sure that what we get okay, is as mistake-free as it could get? And uh, Royal, the terminology Royal uses is he uses the term ironclad control for this idea that you know, the, the words would stop appearing if any mistake was made. And that's, that's kind of a, a thought that sometimes people have is that you know, kind of maybe amongst the you regular members of the church just, yeah, yeah, the, what we have, I mean, the stone wouldn't work, the words wouldn't appear if, uh, if a mistake had been made. And Royal's like, that doesn't seem to be the case based upon the evidence of the text. I mean, in some places, especially names are really helpful here. There are places where names like Coriantumr, if you've never seen the name Coriantumr before, you assume it's going to end with like a T-U-M-M-E-R, which is how Oliver spells it initially. But then he crosses it out and spells it the way that we're used to seeing a T-U-M-R today. And so there's some, there's some sense that there is some control over the text. Joseph was aware of when words were, names were misspelled, and he would make sure that they got spelled correctly. Um, but on the other hand, um, Malachi is spelled wrong in the Book of Mormon, right, in the 1830 edition. It's, er, and so it's... 
or at least in the printers. Um, and so that one isn't changed, right? And so there's, while there was some kind of control, it wasn't ironclad. Mistakes could still be brought into the text. Enough to produce 12 volumes of enough, variants. Exactly. Enough to produce a lot of commentary on Royal's part. And we're probably talking, I think Royal would put the number at about 105,000 um, variant readings in the Book of Mormon, places where changes have been made over time. And so we're not talking five or six, but we're also not talking hundreds of thousands. We're talking about right around 100,000 places where there are variant readings in the Book of Mormon. That could just simply be a was was later changed to a were. It could be that a semicolon was changed to a period. But it could be something like Amlicites are changed to Amalekites or God is changed to Son of God. And so um, Skousen, Skousen looked at a, a number of other things, and he began to see certain patterns. Uh, he, he believes that Joseph could see about 20 to 30 words at a time on the stone, and that he would read those 20 to 30 words off, and then those words would disappear, right? And then the next 20 to 30 words, you know, once they were written. Um, you, you look at places like uh, 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 8, where Lehi is describing this vision that he has, and it's repeated almost word for word in Alma 36, 22. And there's just no way. There's no way that there can't be some kind of control over the text in order for you to have that kind of, you know, uh, a quotation quotation be quoted that concisely. But there are mistakes in the text. And so um, this, this is part of a larger conversation that's ongoing as far as the Book of Mormon goes. In, in 1987, Blake Osler published a really important article arguing that uh, the Book of Mormon, some of, the, some, of the, uh, some of the changes and some of the things that could be perceived as modern touches in the Book of Mormon were places where Joseph had some freedom to bring his own insight into the text. And uh, Royal says, well, that, you know, sometimes that's called loose control, right? The idea that Joseph could kind of, in some places, yeah, the Lord said, this has got to be here. In other places, Joseph could use his prophetic gifts and bring things into the text. Royal would say that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems that there's some kind of control. Joseph isn't just allowed to bring his insights into it. But the Lord, at the same time, isn't sitting there saying you have to get every word right. And so that's, that's what he means by uh, tight control. The, the curious thing here, though, is we use the word translation. If, if Royal's right, and you know, we, we look at the witness statements, and we have Joseph reading a text off of a seer stone or off the Nephite interpreters, and that text is in English, then what Joseph doing isn't translating. He's not a translator of the text. He's a transmitter of the text. But that means someone else, and that's the question that that kind of lays that is kind of unanswered in Royal's project is what is the source of that English text? If it's not Joseph Smith, because Joseph is reading the words off the stone, someone is putting the English on the stone. So who's that person? If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication being discussed, BYU's Religious Study Center is a great place to check out. The RSC has recently published a new book called Battlefields to Temple Grounds, Latter-day Saints in Guam and Micronesia, edited by Devin Jensen and Rosalind Mano ram this is the first comprehensive history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Guam and Micronesia. After Japan's bombings of Hawaii, Guam, and Wake Island, Latter-day Saint military personnel arrived in Micronesia. Waves of missionaries began teaching the military personnel and islanders, leading to the creation of the Micronesia Guam Mission and the Marshall Islands Mission. As a result, some of these former Pacific battlefields have now become peaceful temple grounds. To read about the fascinating Latter-day Saint history there and the stories related to it, check out and pick up the book called Battlefields to Temple Grounds, Latter-day Saints in Guam or Micronesia. You can find it at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Ryan Sharp from BYU Ancient Scripture interview his colleague Nick Frederick 
about Nick's recent article on the contributions of royal Skousen to the study of the Book of Mormon. In part two of our religion, we like to explore a little bit more about why this research matters. How can it inform and help us in our own personal discipleship, in learning and living aspects of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ? In this part two, Professor Frederick will share some insights about the Book of Mormon as the most correct of any book on the earth and provides us some advice as church members as we work to deepen our own knowledge and faith in the Book of Mormon. Let me ask a follow-up that may be on the minds of our listeners um, as they listen to this. Many of them have probably had someone who perhaps is antagonistic towards the church say something like, how can you say it's the most correct book on earth when it has whatever the number was, a hundred and whatever thousand uh, mistakes or variants. What what response would you give to that? Um, I would say that that's kind of a 21st century conception of most correct. I mean, we hear most correct today, and we think most accurate, most concise. We think of things like punctuation, right? Uh, I'll jo- when Joseph makes that statement, his concern is that the missionary efforts that are being done by the church as they go to the British Isles and things like that, they're using the Bible more than they're using the Book of Mormon. And so he, all Joseph is trying to do is say, hey, folks, the Book of Mormon is should be used just as much as the Bible is. Okay, And so he's trying to bring the Book of Mormon up to the level of the Bible. He's not saying that every single word or every single thing in there is correct. What he's saying is the doctrine, right, the teachings of the book, are the most correct that you'll find. If you're going to use the Bible, uh, you better be using the Book of Mormon too, because that's where the correct doctrine is being taught. And I, th- I think in some cases we've perhaps we've overcorrected a little bit, and now the we've kind of downgraded the Bible a little bit. We kind of look on it somewhat suspiciously, um, and we elevate the Book of Mormon and we put it on in this spot where we assume it it there can't be any variance or there can't be any changes because it's the most quote unquote correct. But all, I think all Joseph is doing there is saying the source of truth is more likely found in the Book of Mormon than anywhere else. So use it when you use the Bible in your preaching. Oh, that's really helpful. And in fact, that reminded me of, uh, I was sitting in a class of one of our colleagues, Dr. Gay Strathern, and she was quoting from the article of faith, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God. And then she said, you know, usually we think of, well, as far as it is translated correctly. And, uh, and I'll never forget, she, she stood up and, and with confidence and boldness said, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God, period. And then adds this idea of, now let's talk about translation, transmission, uh, et cetera. But I, I, I love that point in that testimony. Yeah, amen to, to Dr. Strather. Yeah. From an academic and intellectual perspective, obviously this is fascinating. As we consider the importance of the Book of Mormon, you know, as the keystone of our religion, and in many ways the keystone of, of our collective faith, what do you see as some of the major implications for members of the church? So maybe shifting from the, both the, the intellectual side, uh, are there spiritual implications that you see, things that may influence um, commitment to the Book of Mormon, discipleship, etc.? Um, to me, this, this fascinating thing about this, even though it's, it is in large part an academic study for me, this is my field, I do intertextuality, so I love text. This just reinforces for me the, the divine origins of the Book of Mormon. That there, there is a divine hand involved in this, right? Um, something that is kind of overseeing the production of the Book of Mormon, something that's making sure that, that what we have is what we need to have, right? In some fashion, the, the language of Nephi, the language of Mormon, Moroni, their voices are being maintained, right? There's, there's definitely a sense that that this text um, has a divine oversight to it. But at the same time, I love how there's also kind of a, a human yeah. element to it, right? The Lord, it, the Lord could have just dropped, you know, a, a, a perfect, perfectly rendered, as perfectly as you can render any translation, but a perfectly rendered English version of the Book of Mormon into our laps at any point if he wanted to. But instead, he chooses to go through a, a 19th century you know, um, young prophet, and say, hey, you're going to be tasked with doing this, and it's not going to be easy, and you're going to have to develop some tools along the way, and you might lose some pages along the way, right? But you're the one who's going to do it. And so it's this, this wonderful merging of, of the human and the divine that you get in the Book of Mormon that I just I find so fascinating. 
Uh, as a professor of ancient scripture, you've obviously spent a lot of time teaching students in a way that's uh, to use uh, BYU vernacular, intellectually enlarging and spiritually strengthening. What advice would you give our listeners as they try to deepen their knowledge and faith in the Book of Mormon? That's a great question. Um, one of the things I would suggest, and this is what I do with my own Book of Mormon students, is I would recommend picking up a different edition of the Book of Mormon. Um, you know, a lot of us, we have our seminary copies, we have our missionary copies, the ones we use in institute. Um, they're all marked up. We have our notes. We have certain passages that are marked. And what I find is that we tend to gravitate towards things that are marked. We gravitate towards those notes, and we perhaps ignore things that aren't marked because that's our we just kind of um, select, right? Oh, I marked this, so it must be important. And if you pick up a different version, one that's not just one that isn't marked, but one that maybe lines up the text differently, it just forces your brain to read it again for the first time kind of thing. And so that you have to now um, approach it as kind of a first-time reader. You don't have your own notes. You don't have the way you're used to the text reading, right? And so, again, just kind of giving giving your mind something else to work with. So I'd recommend something like Grant Hardy's a Maxwell Study Edition of the Book of Mormon or his uh, Reader's Edition of the Book of Mormon. I'd recommend getting a replica 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon and just reading it from in a different way, in a way that you're not used to doing after 10 or 20 or 30 years of reading the Book of Mormon. I think you'll be you'll be surprised at what you uncover when you're not looking at these same exact pages over and over and over again. And it, it's clear that you're speaking from experience, so I'd, I'd love to maybe ask a follow-up personal question, if it's okay. Uh, what was What was your experience like as you did that, and as you've done that over the years, it, it, for the first time, picked up a different, you, you know, you mentioned a, a different format where the Grant Hardy study edition, for example, it, it looks different visually, yeah. and as you're approaching it, it, just talk to us about what your experience was like with that. So I remember so distinctly walking through the BYU bookstore, this must have been right around 2004, 2005, I'd just only been married for a couple of years. And I saw Grant Hardy's Reader's Edition of the Book of Mormon just on the shelf. I'd never seen it before. It had just been published. And I was like, what is this? What is a Reader's Edition of the Book of Mormon? I already have a copy in my quad. What's a Reader's Edition? That's kind of arrogant to say you have a Reader's Edition of the Book of Mormon. But I picked it up, and I went ahead and bought it anyway. And I've never gone back hmm. away from it in, in 16 years, 17 years, however long it's been. That's my version of the Book of Mormon that I use in my own personal study. Uh, it was... Blew my mind just what I was able to pull out and extract from the book that I had never seen before. Just the way that Grant has arranged um, the paragraphs, you know, the headings that he has as part of the, you know, kind of guide readers through. He downplays kind of the, you know, the 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 numbering, the verses, so that they don't you don't you don't kind of see yourself as going from one verse to another, going from one sentence to another. It's just so much more readable. I never got, I don't think I ever got more out of the Book of Mormon than I did the first time I read Grant's Reader's Edition. And like I said, that's that's on my shelf. It's one of my absolute most, you know, um, treasured books. And um, yeah, it's been an invaluable thing for me to have. Then I would say seek out different perspectives. Like the Book of Mormon for Latter-day Saints, I think represents kind of the democratization of Scripture, right? It's, it's a book where... All you have to do is be a faithful reader, be you know, be inspired, have the gift of prophecy and revelation. You know, you can sit down and get something out of the Book of Mormon. And I think sometimes we 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 tend to downplay how much other people can bring to our reading. Um, don't be afraid to get different perspectives, different ideas. Don't fall into the idea of just thinking that there's just one way to read this text. When I read Nephi's story, there's just one way to read Nephi's story, right? And so. You know, talk to talk to friends. Um, listen for different perspectives in Sunday school, uh, family members. If there's verses that you've found, hey, I, I, this is I never noticed this before. Bring it. Just talk to somebody about it. Just have conversations and see how someone else can kind of broaden your perspective. Um, and and I would say additionally, seek out the work of of scholars. I mean, I, th- I think the idea that there's Book of Mormon scholarship. Seems weird to some people, right? Because this is again, this this is kind of the, this is the people's scripture. The Bible has scholars. What what does a Book of Mormon scholar look like? 
But these are people who have, women and men, who've devoted you know, decades of their lives to studying the text. They bring different tools, they bring different perspectives. You don't have to agree necessarily with everything that they say, but just recognize that there are different views that can enrich your own if you give them the chance. If you're interested in reading all of Professor Frederick's article, it's not an easy task, but it cannot be avoided on the contributions of Royal Skousen, published in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. We have included a link to the full text provided by the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies on our website at whyreligion.byu.edu. And because I haven't mentioned this for a while, while I have you, if you want positive messages on your social media feed and ways to share aspects of the podcast with friends, be sure to follow the Why Religion podcast on Instagram at Why Religion Podcast. Okay, we've arrived at our last segment, part three, where we like to discuss things a little bit more personally with the professor as we wrap up this enlightening and edifying episode. Professor Frederick shares his own personal thoughts and feelings on the Book of Mormon. One final question then, and I'll let you take this whatever direction you want and kind of have the final word. It's always you, dangerous, right? Well, exactly. I'll, I'll jump in if needed. Okay. So, You have spent a lot of time, and, and it's clear from this conversation, studying, writing on, teaching the Book of Mormon. Hopefully, hopefully by this point our, our listeners can see you are one of the leading minds in Book of Mormon studies. Uh, I want to just end the interview giving you a few minutes to share your personal thoughts and feelings of the Book of Mormon. Obviously, this has come up throughout the conversation, but just kind of a final invitation. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, the Book of Mormon has been with me as long as I can remember. Um, I remember reading its words. I remember you know, singing Book of Mormon stories in primary. I can't remember a point in my life when I didn't have the Book of Mormon, but I don't know if it ever— it never resonated with me the way the Bible did as I was going up through high school. I felt like the New Testament spoke to me more than any book did. And so when I was choosing a, a, you know, what kind of college degree I wanted to seek, I chose classics because I wanted to study the, the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament, and I felt like I just wanted—there was that text called to me, right? And— and I thought that's what I was going to do. Was I was going to be a I was going to be a biblical scholar, and I you know I got my BA and MA here in BYU in classics, and I went to to Claremont Graduate University to get my PhD. And I, again, I pursued biblical studies classes. I continued my training in Greek and Hebrew. I thought that's what I was going to do. And then when I, thanks in no small part to Richard Bushman, who was my my doctoral advisor at at Claremont. Richard is an incredible, I mean, obviously he's an incredible historian, but he's an incredible reader of the Book of Mormon, which is something I didn't realize about him until I started interacting with him and taking classes from him. And he opened up my eyes to how rich the Book of Mormon could be. And so when I sat down to write my dissertation, I said, why not do something that involves both the Bible, which is what my training was, and the Book of Mormon, which I was coming to to, to feel like I, I wanted to understand a little bit more. I kind of, I think I... I made the mistake of thinking, oh, I, I, you know, I know who Nephi is. I, I know, you know, I know what happens in Alma thirty-six, and you know, I, Jesus comes into the and, and I know this stuff, and I kind of exhausted the Book of Mormon. But as I sat down to write my dissertation, and as then I kind of decided what I wanted to do with my own academic journey, the Book of Mormon started to call to me in a way that the Bible had before, and I think part of that was my own kind of arrogance in a way and thinking that I understood the Book of Mormon enough that I didn't need to do it anymore. But as I invited the Spirit and as I sought to understand the book on a deeper level, it became more and more of a passion for me uh, to the point where when I was hired here at BYU, and again, I'd expected I would I would do biblical scholarship. I studied Paul. You know, I, I write about the Book of Revelation. I figured that's what I was going to do. But I found myself drawn to the Book of Mormon, which if you told me that five years earlier, I wouldn't I wouldn't have believed it. I just I just didn't understand how rich the text was. And so as my my decade here at BYU has been largely devoted, uh, thanks to that time that I spent in Claremont, thanks to the kind of awakening I had, uh, it's been devoted by and large to really Book of Mormon scholarship. Um, I've I've you know, I, I actively seek to teach Book of Mormon classes every semester so I don't get away from it. You know, I, I, want, I want to keep pushing myself to understand the text more and more and more. And so um, I, I, everything, every time I write something, 
I always try to find some way to bring the Book of Mormon into it. Um, I've tried to find ways to write into the academy about the Book of Mormon so that other pe- you know people outside the church can discover that this book really does have a lot of cool things to say, right? E- e- even if you don't believe in its its divine origins, you can pick up the Book of Mormon and and just get lost in its pages. And that's that's really, I mean, it, again, looking back, if you had told you know the Nick of of two thousand nine that this was going to be where he'd end up, you know, thirteen fourteen years later, I don't know if I would have believed you. But this last ten years of just jumping into the Book of Mormon, jumping into the work of, of Royal Skousen and Grant Hardy and Terrell Givens and Brant Gardner and Richard Bushman, and my own colleagues Joe Spencer, Amy Easton Flake, uh, your own work, Ryan, on the Book of Mormon, I'm just. I'm just, I, I, I love everything I can get. I just, I eat up as much as I can. And I just look back at, at you know, where I was 15 years ago and just laugh at the thought that, you know, that somehow I had, I had climbed to the, to, the, to the top of the mountain when it came to the Book of Mormon. I understood everything I needed to understand. And it was time to turn my attention to more important texts. And it has been a humbling journey the last 10 years as I realized just how much I didn't know and just how far I had to go. But every time I turn to the Book of Mormon, I always find something there. And it's been a great ride. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, Jared Halverson, Ryan Sharp, Hank Smith, Beverly Yellowhorse, Elena Wainsgard, and Brad Wilcox. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU student Mitchell Bashford. Say hi, Mitchell. Hi, guys. Original music and scoring for Why Religion podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the Everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.